I'm Molly Pettit. I am a data visualization slash data science freelancer, and I also organize the Chicago Data Viz community meetup that I mentioned earlier. I'm Chris Kacharzik. I'm a data scientist at IDEO, and that's how you say my last name. <laughs> I'm Rachel Murphy. I'm an attorney working on police practices at the ACLU of Illinois, and not a data person at all. Okay. Um, but tonight, we are going to talk to you about a project that we all worked on, um, where we looked at data um, from Illinois traffic stops and what it showed um, with regards to racial disparities. So the data that we looked at is collected under a state law called the Illinois Traffic and Pedestrian Stop Statistical Study Act. So it's been in place since 2003. It was uh, an effort by then State Senator Barack Obama to address the widespread problem of racial profiling. Um, so it requires all law enforcement agencies in Illinois to collect and report traffic stop data. And then um, they report that to the Illinois Department of Transportation, which then compiles all of those agencies' data, it analyzes it, and it publishes a report every year, and it also publicly releases the raw data, which is what we looked at, or what they looked at. Um, so this is an example of the form that officers use when they conduct a traffic stop. So you can see that it just collects some basic information about um, the interaction. So first, um, the officer will mark down their subjective determination of the driver's race. They then will note the reason for the stop, whether a search occurred, and if so, what kind of search, and if any contraband was recovered during the search. And then finally, they'll, look, they'll mark down um, the outcome of the stop. So one point that I would really like to highlight is that this act is actually set to be repealed in July of this year. And um, we are advocating that it should be made permanent or at least be extended for another few years. So it's been in place for 15 years now, and in that time, it's provided a lot of transparency about police stops to the public. Um, it allows law enforcement officers to look at their own data, to compare themselves to other agencies, and to look at their practices and see if there are any racial disparities, and if so, um, start thinking about what they can do to alleviate those disparities and really start a dialogue with the community to identify local solutions. Um, and then also data collection is also um, something that's happening all over the country. There are about 15 other states that have similar laws in place that collect this data permanently. So uh, we think that Illinois should follow suit and just make this data collection permanent. Um, and then this is just a quote that a former law enforcement officer submitted in a statement in support of continuing the data collection. And as you can see, um, he's recognizing that it makes for good police work and it helps improve police community relations. All right, so people often ask me how I got involved in this project and working with the ACLU. So I'm gonna give you like the origin story of this project and kind of how it evolved um, to get bigger and bigger and, until it is what it is now. So there's me. I went to a tech solidarity meeting, which was, um, the whole point of it was to bring people in tech who wanted to give their time and their skills to some sort of social good something, and then organizations who were looking for those people. And that's where I met Karen Sheely, uh, who works for the ACLU, um, and also met Rachel uh, and Max Bever. Um, so what they really wanted was some help uh, with some data analysis so that they could um, use it in a report. They tried to do a report every couple years on this data. So I actually brought it uh, to the company that I was working for at the time, uh, Datascope Analytics, and I convinced them to basically let me uh, bring it into the company and get um, some of my colleagues to work on it when they, were, they had some downtime. Um, so that was great. And then Chris actually joined the company and he was super excited about it. Um, and I actually, shortly after that, I ended up uh, leaving Datascope, um, but Chris and I have been working on it still ever since. 
Um, and then Alex Alievich, who's here, uh, he joined just a few months ago doing some front-end work. So what actually started as a project to do some data analysis uh, to help them uh, just get some information for the report actually grew into us creating a website um, for, well, creating a website that would showcase this data visually and allow people to not only see kind of an overall story of Illinois, but also select specific agencies and see what's happening in those agencies. So the purpose of this site, and this is what we're gonna be mostly talking about today, um, this particular, the website, uh, although their uh, report is also live, FYI, it launched last week also, so you can find that too. So there's a couple purposes. One is to serve as a resource for the public uh, to learn about these law enforcement practices, but also uh, really to provide a tool for law enforcement agencies so they can make informed improvements and be aware of uh, the data concerning their particular agency. So in working on this project, there was a few questions that we we're thinking through and trying to answer, which was one, how do we visualize the data so that it conveys this complex information in a way that's easy to understand? Uh, two, how do we incorporate statistical significance into this visual representation? Because this was something that we felt was very important, and I think you'll see why later. Um, and how do we create a website that both tells a general story about Illinois, but also allows for data exploration and for digging into particular agencies? I'm gonna hand it off to Chris to tackle the first couple points. So like Molly said, one of the questions was how do we convey all of the different information that's entered by these officers in a way that's easy to understand? Uh, we're not the first people to try to do this, and in fact there's some work done by the Open Policing Project, which is run out of Stanford University, to try to capture some of these disparities. And they often take the form of something that looks like this chart. Um, so what you see here is the rate at which minority drivers are searched. Uh, black drivers are shown in blue, Hispanic drivers are shown in green, uh, relative to the rate at which white drivers are searched. If the two rates are equal, the dots which represent individual departments uh, would fall along this dashed line. But because they cluster above the line, that's indicative of the fact that minorities tend to be searched at much higher rates than white drivers. Um, these visualizations provide a lot of information in a very dense way, but it's not really easy to read out that information in a way that's intuitive or easily interpretable. Um, so we wanted to break down these visualizations into their constituent parts and try to turn them into something that was a little bit easier to read. So we started just by plotting an individual agency, say Chicago. Uh, and saying that black drivers were searched at a rate of 2% while white drivers were searched at a rate of 1%, uh, and then try to build that into a larger visualization, but that still had some of these problems where it, it wasn't easy to just look at something and, and understand easily what it meant. Um, so we decided to make an incremental change to the design where instead of plotting the, the absolute rates, we plotted the, the relative rates or the ratio on the y-axis, um, so what you're seeing here is the rate at which white drivers were searched, and then uh, the ratio or the, the uh, relative rate at which black white drivers were searched relative to white drivers. Um, so for this big dot at the bottom, white drivers were searched at around 35%, and black drivers were searched uh, two times less than that. Or I'm sorry, this is uh, for citations. Um, this is a little bit more readable, but it's conveying some other information because when you have small rates, the multipliers can get really high, which gives this weird curviness to the data. And it also doesn't give us a good way to convey significance. Um, so we decided to make the visualization a little bit simpler by taking away information. And that's how we ended up with the visualizations that you see on the site. So we're only plotting along one axis here, which is that relative rate. Uh, and how much more likely were minority drivers to be searched or cited than white drivers. Um, so you can see for a given data point, and this is pointing to the city of Chicago, uh, black drivers in the city of Chicago were about two and a half times more likely to be searched than white drivers. We and, request a search. This is I'm sorry. Yeah, I'll get into request. what that's about later, but yeah. yeah. So this is providing a sort of one sentence, really easy, easily readable way to see and interpret what it is that's, that's the important takeaway and that's easier for people to understand. 
Um, furthermore, uh, we talked about statistical significance. We're using a test called the Z-test for population proportions, which essentially says, how likely is it that we would observe this difference in rates by chance? Uh, and we decided to use opacity to convey significance. And that's drawing your eye more naturally to see what are the things that stand out, because they literally stand out uh, in a much more visual way than rates, or I'm sorry, agencies where the rates are not statistically significant or were deemed to have possibly been due to chance and not due to systemic behavior on the part of people making these decisions. Um, and we also have individual uh, bar graphs so that we can show the, the rates individually uh, and you can get a little bit more granular with the data as well. All right, so that brings us to the last point, which is um, how to tell this overarching story, but also allow for uh, people to really explore the data and look at specific agencies. So, oh yeah, this is my reminder to now move to the website if I haven't yet already. Here's the website. I'm actually going to move down. Um, I'm going to skip by some of this top stuff, but feel free to ask about it later during Q&A. I just don't have time to go through the entire site and explain everything. Um, so anyway, this is the <laughs> contraband uh, hit rate comparison plot. Um, so what this is doing is it's comparing the rate at which contraband was found uh, for minority drivers versus white drivers uh, for all of the agencies. So every single one of these bubbles represents an agency, and by hover you can see which one that is. So there's a reason why we start with this plot before diving into searches. Um, we talk about it a bit up here uh, as to why that is. So basically, some people might argue that the rate at which drivers are searched or asked to be searched is not necessarily an indicator of discrimination because perhaps agency searches, agencies search a particular uh, group more because their experience is that that group is found with contraband more often. So this is a common argument, and that's why we decided to first look at the contraband hit rates before moving on to searches. So as we look at this, Chris was just talking about statistical significance, and I think by looking at this plot, you can see why we felt that was really important, because if that is not shown here, if everything were the same, um, it wouldn't quite be telling the same story, um, and you just wouldn't have as much information. So. Uh, as looking at this, you can see um, that uh, for the most part, for the majority of agencies, uh, they do not show statistically significantly different rates between the rate at which contraband was found for minority drivers uh, compared to white drivers. And in the few agencies that do show a, a significant difference between these rates, it actually um, shows that uh, white drivers were found with contraband more uh, for those particular instances. Um, like significantly more. So this bar plot also shows uh, similarly that across Illinois, if you're looking at all of the stops um, done at all agencies, uh, that this is still, this holds up that um, white drivers uh, were found with statistically, or significantly more, um, sorry, their contraband hit rate was significantly more than both black and Latinx uh, drivers. So by looking at these, um, we see that co the contraband hit rate does not provide us with evidence that any agency should uh, search minority drivers more than white drivers. So I'm going to move on to the search request rate comparison. Um, and you might be asking, why are we looking at the request rate? And also, what is that? So there's a few different reasons that someone, um, that an officer might search somebody. And uh, unlike other searches that require officers to identify some sort of suspicion of a crime, the decision to conduct a consent search where an officer actually asks the driver uh, for consent to search them or the vehicle, uh, it's left to the subjective judgment of that officer. And although someone could say yes or no, uh, people often feel as though they have to say yes. So these uh, subjective and unreviewed decisions, they raise concerns about racial bias, uh, both unconscious and conscious. So now let's look at what these trends are showing. Um, we can see that there are many agencies that ask for consent to search both black and Latinx drivers uh, significantly more than white drivers. Um, and the, blot, excuse me, the bar plot uh, also shows this same trend. I also talked about the ability to 
focus on particular agencies. Uh, so there's a couple ways you can do that on this site. Um, if you see a particular uh, bubble that you think is interesting, if you click on it, everything throughout the site, all the agency specific text and uh, the charts will update uh, to focus on that particular agency. Additionally, if you decided, for example, we wanted to look at Illinois State and find it there, and everything will update. Let's look at Chicago, actually, since that's where we are. Uh, yeah. So um, this, it allows agencies to focus on their particular metrics uh, while also seeing overall trends. And I think it allows um, the public uh, to be able to see the, the overall story, whether or not they dig into the data more. So there's more charts here to look at. Uh, feel free to look on the website and feel free to ask us about it later. Um, but I'm going to skip down to something that Rachel mentioned earlier, which is that uh, this, uh, I'm just going to call it the Traffic Stops Act, because I always stumble when I try to say the whole thing. Um, it's set to expire in July. And uh, there's a new bill that's actually going to be introduced very soon. So we uh, would urge people to contact the representatives, especially uh, once there's a new bill number. If you want to be kept up to date on what's happening with all of this, um, you can sign up for a newsletter. And I promise we're not going to spam you, but we can tell you when there's a new bill introduced, at least. Um, additionally, uh, we're looking into the possibility of um, uh, getting, applying for grants and things uh, to help support some like an extension of this that we think that there's a lot more that could be done here uh, even if you're just looking at one state there's so much more that could be shown and explorable um, and then there's also this uh, bigger potential to add in other state data because there's a lot of other states that do this um, so if anyone knows of anything good that we should be applying for you can let me know and then if you also want to personally contribute um, there's that ability as well so I think that's all we have for you right now, and we're ready for questions, so thank you. Hi. So Hello. I have a question. Suppose you have sort of a variable real crime rate. So sometimes the crime rate is very high, other times it's very low. And I can't predict when it's going to be high or low, so I allocate police on average to an area that's it's a high allocation. So there's a lot of downtime. Okay. So my cops are just sitting in their car, and then they're on YouTube, and then a citizen films them on YouTube, and they complain. So they say, guys, you got to do something. So they start pulling over motorists. Well, because I've allocated a lot of police to high minority areas, now I'm disproportionately targeting minority motorists. But the motivation is simply because I don't want my officers to not do anything. So to what degree do you think that explanation holds any water at all? And if that is the case, what is the alternative approach to efficiently allocating your human resources so that they're not in their squad cars watching YouTube for six hours waiting for the call? Do you have any thoughts on this, Rachel? Um, I will try to answer a little bit of that. I think that that's one of those questions that collecting the data allows you to look at because you can actually see if you know, there were more stops made, and why were there more stops made? But that's one of the reasons, for instance, in our report, we focused, and on the website too, but there, you guys are much more, covering a lot more ground. Anyways, we focused predominantly on these consent searches and dog sniff searches, because these are con discretionary searches that um, tell a different story than just when a police officer yeah. pulls somebody over. So I'll add something um, when you're done too. Yeah, so it that gives you a different um, perspective of that interaction because once you you're only looking then at people who have already been pulled over, and then you're still seeing these racial disparities. So you're still seeing that those officers made the decision to ask the driver if they had consent to a search or to use a dog during the search, and so that's where you're kind of getting a different picture. Um, but yeah, I think that data collection allows you to really look into what's going on and answer those questions that you have and um, that's something that law enforcement agencies can be using to evaluate themselves. Yeah, I was just going to add, uh, she made a good point um, and uh, if you look at the site you'll notice that we actually 
focus exclusively on things that happen after a stop has been made. Um, we don't even really put a lot of focus, actually we don't put any focus on like a stop rate um, because there's a lot of things that make that nearly impossible to actually calculate accurately. Um, so uh, the th that's why the things that we uh, put a lot of focus on are things that once a stop has happened, then what happens? Um, because those are things that are very, there's very clear and concrete numbers for. We've got a question from the doc. <clears throat> what are some of the challenges of working in a team of technical and non-technical collaborators? How did you overcome those? Did you guys feel like there were any issues at any point? I feel like we just kind of like rocked it the whole time. <laughs> no <laughs> challenges. No, I mean, this idea of statistical significance, I think, is one that often comes up as, uh, there's this desire to say this is significant and this is not significant. Whereas it's a little bit more fluid than that. So when you do a, a calculation of significance, you get some number and you set some threshold, whatever your p-value is or whatever it is. And it's trying to communicate some of the nuance of the more technical things can often be challenging. But sure. I think that's where it's helpful to have these, these visuals where you can say, oh, you know, even though this number is five times higher than this other number, because the dot is much smaller, it's actually not significant. Sure. Um, so it's, it's getting visual early and, and being that this was a visual project, uh, I think helped a lot in overcoming some of those barriers of technical communication. Yeah, I think, yeah, and the only other thing I can think of is um, uh, there was a push to, to plot some things that were involving stop rate um, and so kind of having to explain like why we didn't want to do that um, and what were the the reasonings for that and um, so there but that wasn't really like an issue it's just kind of like a thing that came up I don't know do you have any grievances you want to air <laughs> no, yeah. I, I was just gonna say that I do think it's helpful to really understand what we're looking at and have you there to answer questions and explain you know why you chose to present something that way and kind of uh, it just helps us understand the data better as non-technical people. <laughs> um, you talked about looking at the data from the perspective of departments. Uh, in the data itself, is, is there identifiers for individual people making stops um, mm -hmm. or like lat long? That, so you could look at it maybe from nope. stops that happen in certain places or for certain people? No, they don't give, so they collect uh, officer identifiers as part of the form, but they don't release that publicly. They also record the beat location of the stop, and some departments choose to publish the, the routes of their beat, and some don't. And in data that, or in general, that data was so dirty that it wasn't really worthwhile to try to pull out those specific locations. So two of my biggest things were, um, if we wanted to look at individual officer behavior or get a better sense for whether specific locations were being over-policed, those were two ways to get at that, but, but they have the data, it's just that they don't release it publicly. So that was for sure a frustration of ours. Yeah, when he says beat location, literally, it's just like numbers, right? It's yeah, like, it's like beat four, yeah. but they don't tell you what beat four is. Yeah. I do think though that, that there are certain departments where you can figure that out, like yeah. Chicago. Um, so, uh, and we did look at that uh, just a very simple um, an inquiry into where they were making stops because Chicago saw a really high increase of stops over the last three years. And um, we saw that they were making more stops throughout the entire city, although it was some, we broke it down by district and some districts did have much higher rates, but it was a citywide thing. What are some actionable plans with this data? That one's all you. <laughs> Well, number one, continue collecting it um, since it ends in July of this year. Uh, so that would mean that we, in July of this year, the Illinois Department of Transportation will release last year's data. So we still will get probably two more years of it. But um, number one, continue collecting it. Um, and we just really think that it's something that not only the public should look into, but law enforcement agencies should really use as this tool to evaluate their practices and see, you know,
where there are disparities happening. And um, one example of an agency that actually did that was Urbana and their former police chief did exactly that and looked at where there were racial disparities and then worked with the community to try and figure out what they could do to um, lessen those. And they actually did improve their numbers. So I think that's a good example of an agency actually making use of the data. But unfortunately, we don't really know how many agencies are doing that. But we would encourage them to. Yeah, I think one concrete thing for me and something that we're, we're still working on is identifying those agencies that have been able to proactively change. Um, so there, there are a number of different agencies in Illinois, and I can't remember what they are off the top of my head, but that experience changes in leadership, and that led to a dramatic improvement in the, their numbers. So the disparities got much, much less um, to the point that it was you know, going from something that was incredibly significant to not significant at all. So I think being able to highlight those stories and point to those success stories as models for other departments to follow. Um, that's something that we're, we're still working on, but is a concrete and actionable step um, to, to sort of elevate those. So I've lived this data. Um, I'm from North Texas, and there's genuinely a sense that if you bring this up, there's an unwillingness to believe you. It's like, well, you can't be sure about this officer, or maybe that's in your head, and, and you really have no ability to prove this at yeah. an anecdotal level. Um, this is a two-part question. And I was just talking to uh, my friend who's a officer in South Carolina, and he was saying, look, Cameron, I treat every person that I pull over the exact same way. And if an officer is making a biased decision, that's just a, a prejudicial cop, and that's not uh, systems things, that's just the officer. How do, you, um, how do you address arguments of that sort with data like this? Or what are the opportunities to talk about that in a new context? So I feel like there's a lot of stuff in the pulled over book. I don't know if I can talk about it really well. Do you feel like you can? a good question. OK, so I'm going to like do my best, and Rachel might help me out. Um, there's a book called Pulled Over that did a really big study on this stuff. Um, I, uh, traffic stops? Kansas City. Kansas City, OK. Um, and from what I remember reading um, from some of their conclusions and some of the, the, the things that they were talking about is that um, they felt that it was less about, uh, less often an individual person, like people have this uh, idea in their head of like what a racist cop would be like, um, and that it's often not necessarily that, um, and that it, a lot of it uh, comes from maybe just like policies that like indirectly lead uh, to this, or, um, or un a lot of unconscious bias as well, um, uh, rather than someone saying, this person is X, and therefore I'm going to do this. Um, that's kind of uh, what I got from that. Do you have more to add? I'll just say um, one example of like a policy or department training that led to disparities is um, in like 2013, the Illinois State Police had a training, and in that training, they said that um, you know they were encouraging all of their officers to basically pull over everybody. So any traffic violation, pull them over. But then once you pull them over, you know use that as an opportunity to investigate other crimes. And maybe that kind of sounds reasonable. But then when you think about it, that means that you have a broken tail light, and now they're using it to investigate you for drug trafficking. Or you know it's it leads to a lot more and it leads to, almost every car on the street has probably committed a traffic violation while they've been out there. Um, and so what that book uh, by Charles Epp pulled over talks about is these kinds of investigatory stops. And when people can tell when they're pulled over for a traffic safety violation or more of these investigatory stops, which are generally racial profiling, and um, that makes them trust the police less, and it makes them less likely to call them for help when they need it. And um, it, it's something that uh, just, um, well, I don't know what you were gonna say, but. <laughs> no, yeah, so 
people can tell the difference and uh, sorry go ahead yeah no and I was just gonna say and that that's an example of something that could be more of like a policy of a particular agency that right. that they that would promote that. like those kind of um, uh, that yeah investigatory stops so that's like a policy agency policy decision rather than an individual, an individual bias officer. decision yeah does that do you does that make sense I was just wondering if you guys had done any um, research into the race or background of the police officers that were pe pulling people over, like if there was a higher propensity of them to be Caucasian, or if that was any sort of a impact into your data analysis. Correct me if I'm wrong, but we don't have that information, right? No. So no. That was a short answer. Thank you very, very much. Give it up, everyone. Thank you.